Baxter and others 2010 argue excuse me that um, the coincidental downshift or downward shift in the abundances of uh, these four pelagic fish species reflects a regime shift. They identify other changes in the estuary that have been linked to regime changes elsewhere, particularly the introductions of invasive aquatic weeds, uh, harmful algal blooms, and, and jellyfish. Such regime shifts in aquatic habitats elsewhere have uh, once established been thought to be stable. So thus it's, it's very unlikely that we're going to be able to um, change these this current regime without um, substantial manipulations to the system. Um, in our system, flow manipulations in the ranges oper of, uh, operable ranges of reservoirs may not be able to, to shift this regime. The current regime may not be reversible or change may require forcing on such an extreme level that um, it may be difficult to to achieve or could result for from some type of catastrophic event such as a um, number of levees uh, breaching all at once or massive ha habitat restoration which would not be necessarily a catastrophic event. Randy, to that point, when I look at your trawl studies as they relate to delta smelt, you know, it, 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 you, you confirm what appeared to me and that is the adaptability of some of the pelagics, uh, particularly as it related to the delta smelt. It seemed like although the numbers were declining, there were changes to the you know, credit of in, or the, in, on a positive side in the deep water channel. Uh, you talk about catastrophic events. I guess some, particularly if you'd owned it, would have considered the breaching of Liberty Island to be a catastrophic event but now that is providing habitat uh, to an extent that we'd never seen before because it hadn't been continually flooded before. So does this get back to uh, the validity of the current X2 standards uh, as we talk about this adaptability and changes because of events? I mean, did it well, because um, X2 was established before Liberty Island was breached and probably before you know, whether the populations had been in the deep water channel and they just hadn't been trolled for before or whether they were yeah, found I'll, incidental, I'll, I don't know. I'll, I'll answer briefly in that um, delta smelt uh, use of the northern estuary is, is typically for spawning and early rearing. And still most of the population does move down to the low salinity zone where X2 is beneficial, the X2 standards are, are beneficial in providing habitat in the right locations, low salinity habitat in the right locations. The number of fish um, remaining upstream through the summer seems to be relatively low, you know, 10% or lower so far. And this is, you know, emerging information. We'll know more in the next year or two. So, um, the potential for shifting the reg regime is, is unknown, and even if we do, it's not clear that we'll get something that we want. Um, thus, the current abundance outflow relationships are, are likely to persist into the, to the near future. Um, the third sub-theme is that improved juvenile solvonid survival in the delta requires broad-scale improvement of shoreline and riparian habitat. Uh, juvenile salmonid survival during their migration to the, through the delta tends to be poor. Even in some cases where flow enhancements like the uh, adaptive, uh, pardon me, Vernalis Adaptive Management Program um, are not always showing good survival. In other words, flow is not enough to achieve good survival in the delta. Predation is a contributing factor and Poor habitat within the delta is another contributing factor. Larger smolts may be able to survive reasonably well, migrating with brief spring flow enhancements. However, the smaller fry and par entering the delta need to be able to rear for several weeks to several months prior to their 
um, emigration in order to, for them to be successful in the ocean. And they're not finding much habitat in the levied riprap delta. Habitat needs for juvenile salmonids are known. They require broad, shallow shoals providing low water velocities. These shoals need to be available at a variety of water levels. They need to possess emergent or, and or terrestrial vegetation. And they need to have easy access to faster water. In upstream areas, floodplain habitats provide these types of uh, benefits or conditions for juvenile salmonids, and many of them are, are limited. Uh, the current delta configuration with riprap levees and steep channels will require significant modification in order to provide habitat, and the restoration of these areas will need to be linked uh, to be effective. I assume that previous picture didn't represent refugia. Well, the big fish, no, no, it was it was missing its refugia. Um, the fourth sub theme is uh, sub daily hydrodynamics may be more important to juvenile salmonids than previously understood. Uh, delta water exports are managed to reduce net negative flows in the South Delta to be productive of salmon and other pelagic fishes. Researchers studying juvenile salmonid migration have not reached consensus on the importance of such ne negative flows in the survival of salmonids. Recent, recent acoustic telemetry studies and hydrodynamic analyses suggest that subdaily tidal flow variability appears to be important in juvenile salmonid migration success and should be considered when evaluating water quality objectives intended for the benefit of juvenile salmonids. Could, could I uh, ask a question about this? Um, in reviewing uh, the material, you know, I, I, with sub-daily hydrodynamics, is that another term for uh, the effects of twice-daily tidal flows? Or are we talking about hydrodynamics of riverine flows on a sub-daily level, or both? I think it's I think it's both, but I'll leave it to Brad Cavalla. We'll follow up on this topic in his personal presentation afterwards. Okay, we'll thanks. Answer that question more fully then. Uh, the fifth theme is managing for salmon to life history diversity. Juvenile salmon salmon management within the delta is focused on moving relatively large smolts through the system rapidly as possible during the spring period. This approach ignores important life history diversity contributing to population stability and resilience. In each year class, some individuals migrate earlier and later than the dominant group and their strategies can be important to the overall resilience of the population as a whole. Management actions that contribute to um, poor life history diversity include uh, issues beyond flow, but uh, I'll include a little bit of flow too. Uh, predictable flows in time and space and stable flatline conditions continually favor one life history strategy. Poor rearing habitat including limited or no access to floodplain or marsh habitats, select against life history strategies that disperse early from upstream uh, rearing areas to, to downstream areas. Hatchery management practices also have an effect. Hatchery stocks exhibit reduced fitness resulting from the domestication process of getting them adapted to the hatchery. When they stray to the spawning grounds or natural spawning grounds and intermingle, they reduce the fitness of wild populations. And currently in the Central Valley, a number of uh, small tributaries are seeing hatchery contributions of 40, 50 percent. Life history diversity applies to adults as well in the form of diverse age and maturity and continued ocean harvest, high ocean harvest affects this. A wide age of maturity buffers against year class failures because each year class can provide, uh, each Chinook year class can provide adults that return at three, four, and five years old, sometimes six. But the continued effect of, of um, the ocean fishery on these fish while they're out in the ocean of getting hit year and year 
year out um, limits the number of the fish that would otherwise return at these older ages. They just don't don't survive the fishery. So Randy, thus, buried Randy, flows. Randy, um, can, I ask, can I ask one more question? It's easier than some. Uh, when you look at what triggers a cohort to come back at what stage of its life cycle? Is it all ocean conditions? Is it in anticipation of what's going on in the upstream corridor? Do we have any idea why there's a variability in when these species return? Well, I'll let some of the others chime in a little bit later, but um, age of maturity is a partially heritable trait. So if the big fish are coming back, their genetics suggest or selects for a higher proportion of older age fish. They tend to dominate on the spawning ground, so they have better access. So there are mechanisms that push the, the um, broader age maturity um, back up. But um, there are other situations like growth in the ocean and, and size that I believe also have effects. And I think if they're shaking their heads, then I'm all's good. Yeah, they're shaking it up and down. That's a good sign. Okay. Yeah, that's true. Thank you. So uh, varied flows can have benefits uh, to some honored life history diversity, but uh, true recovery is going to require uh, addressing all these uh, current management hindrances beyond just the flows. Uh, let, let me ask, uh, on, the ha on the hatchery uh, issue, that's really not our I know. Not, it's not our responsibility. Is that being looked at in the in fishing game and, and uh, I'm, I, seriously? I know the issues come up, but I'm I'm not in that uh, in that uh, realm of of um, expertise. So we'll deal with so that. So they're not time. they're not asking me about it. Okay. We were we were hoping at some point we'd have something as bizarre in the state of California as a salmon policy, but apparently that doesn't seem to be needed. So. I assume we'll get that in the next panel, so, okay. I'm interested. Okay. Pardon my tongue-in-cheek comment, Randy. It was not directed at you. Pardon me? My sarcasm was not directed at you, so don't take offense to it, please. Um, or frustration, maybe, would be a better word. No. The, the sixth sub-theme is that San Joaquin River inflow is more important than previously understood. Although uh, the San Joaquin River contributes little flow to downstream regions in most years, there's increasing evidence or recognition of its disproportionately strong uh, role in delta and bay productivity. Uh, recent information suggests that, there, that the San Joaquin is an important source of um, high value phytoplankton and the source of the um, food organism or calanoid copepod pseudodiaptimus pseudo forbizi. Moreover, um, as additional fish sampling is uh, extended into the San Joaquin River, results are indicating that it can be uh, an important source of uh, native fishes, in particular split tail. And I've included uh, the graphic here for the uh, Fish and Wildlife Service beach seine, which is looking at um, the San Joaquin contribution in this top um, section of the, the bars. It may also, the San Joaquin may also be an important spawning and rearing area for Sacramento blackfish. We've yet to, to really look at the data there. And um, possibly an important rearing area for Sacramento pike minnow, particularly when uh, there are high flows and the fish get dispersed downstream. And finally, um, bio biological models are available to enhance the understanding and guide management. Many of the factors contributing to the declines of Central Valley Chinook and pelagic estuarine fishes are known, but their relative importance remains uncertain. And this uncertainty reduces our ability to effectively evaluate alternative management actions. Biological models can help. They can provide a framework for organizing information, for examining the impact of changes in environmental variables, for quality qualifying or quantifying the effects of such changes on the abundance of each life stage and for evaluating cumulative, cumulative impacts on the overall population. In our written submission, we provide examples of um, a couple models that are currently available 
uh, and a number of models that are in development and review for you guys to look at. Uh, life cycle modeling has uh, increased in recent years and, and new models will likely yield new insights and, and management guidance. The models should not be viewed as predictive of future conditions, but instead they can most effectively be applied to explore cost benefits of alterna alternative management strategies, including alternative flow objectives. So that's the end of my presentation here on the, the panel themes. We talked about how pelagic fishes are more flexible in their um, habitat use that regime shift is likely to maintain a muted flow, outflow abundance effects for longfin smelt, probably striped bass and possibly some other fishes. Um, improved juvenile somonid survival in the delta requires broad scale habitat improvement in addition to the flows. Subdaily hydrodynamics can be more important than previously understood and we'll let Brad detail that. Um, managing for cell monitored life history strategies can involve some flows, but it extends well beyond that to other current practices. Uh, San Joaquin River inflow is more important than previously understood in providing uh, productivity benefits and, and habitat for uh, native fishes. And biological models are available to enhance our understanding of guidance and guide management. So that concludes the um, first part, our main panel presentation. And now, uh, if I, I guess we need to switch to another, our other presentation for individual uh, comments from the panel members. And I think you've got me first off again. <laughs> but in this case, it's five minutes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that went a little long, didn't it? But there were questions. Yeah, a lot of that long had to do not with your lack of organization, but to the extent of some of our questions, and that's a, certainly a pass on your part. So. Okay, um, my comments are directed at um, uh, providing some information on how um, IEP and, and Fish and Game in particular are attempting to address some of the uncertainties in, in both our fish sampling and our understanding of um, fish distribution. So we calculate um, relative abundance indices uh, which rely on consistent sampling across time um, and use of consistent gears. Uh, though these don't provide population size, they, they do provide important um, trend information and are used to assess population size. We're attempting to collect information that allow us to move beyond simple uh, abundance indices. And one of the pieces of information is, uh, or some of them include uh, determining how our gear works in the water. Um, we've recently acoustically measured the mouth area of our midwater trawls, which tend to have a dynamic mouth when they're being towed and have good estimates. That'll provide us with the ability to estimate volume filtered, which is the first step in, in looking at or scaling up that information to um, attempt to make a, a population estimate, similar to what, what Ken Newman had uh, written about in, in the online journal in 2008. Um, we've also been tracking the net behavior in the water to look at uh, whether we're actually getting a nice oblique tow like we believe we are and how, how deep specifically the gear is getting so that we can understand what portion of the population we might be censusing. For example, if it's not getting to the bottom, then um, fish that, that are found along the bottom uh, will not be part of that census. Oh, that's too bad. That didn't come up. Uh, here I have a first, first picture of a wild delta smelt. Um, you're, take, sure, yeah. you're sure of that. It's, it's very turbid there. Um, in, in, in you sure that's blue. not a hook right in the middle of its back and that's not a, 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 a 
maybe something that came from a bait shop? Or? It, it, it looks much clearer on my computer. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and yes, in fact, uh, a number of us agree that it was a Delta smelt, even though it's, it's, uh, the, the graphic is, is fairly subject or suggestive. Um, but what, what this was um, to highlight is uh, we've recently began experimenting with the use of uh, what's called a smelt cam which is attached to the back of a midwater trawl and gives us real-time information on when the fish of different species are passing through the gear. And we're planning to use this trawl gear in the near future to look at um, uh, horizontal and vertical distributions of a number of these fishes and, and um, use that information to um, help, our, help us out. I'm going to jump quickly are, are to some of these others because I think I'm, I'm getting my two-minute warning here. Well, I'm going to interrupt you, though, and ask a question. Oh. I'm so sorry. Hey, I'm not asking you the question. You should be happy. Um, the, um, are you using cameras in other ways, not just on the trawl, but in a stationary setting um, to help you? It just seems like the technology's evolved in such a way that you could... Yeah, position cameras the, all over the place. The, the problem with, uh, so this is a, this is, um, a light based camera here, you know, visual and turbidity is an issue. But um, we have started discussions on, on using multi scan sonar, which creates a camera like image. And, and we'll be um, attempting to uh, incorporate those into some other studies that we have coming up. And I'm going to skip the second bullet here. I've seen Oops. some pictures of Bigfoot that were clearer than that one of the Delta yeah, smell. Yeah, yeah. Well, maybe my printout looks a little better, but I'll come share it with you on the break. Um, we're also working to prove um, our information on fish distribution. And I've alluded to some of the, the um, information that uh, we found recently on shifts in distribution. And I wanted to point out that we're, Fish and Game has recently um, extended a, a couple of their summer, uh, a summer and a fall survey into the Cache Slough Deepwater Ship Channel area uh, to allow us to, to get better information on what's going on there, both to identify um, you know, specifically how Delta smelt are using the area, but also as um, a precursor to any habitat modification that's going up there, we'll have some baseline information. Uh, so, and we'll be able to use this, this information, or we are using this information in some of our synthesis work currently that will come out um, after the start of the year. And I also wanted to point out that um, there's a very large study going on in conjunction with FLASH uh, or the fall low salinity habitat study that's aimed at looking at the underlying um, mechanisms uh, associated with good or bad habitats. So that's it for me. I just wanted to remind uh, the audience and, uh, and the board that these are now the comments of individuals in case just to make sure that it's not part of the panel report. It's, it's um, uh, individuals making comments in addition to the report. Is that kind of like a disclaimer, Kim? No comment. And I don't think it's coincidental that he made that disclaimer right before I presented it. Uh, good morning. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here before you today. Um, I watched the proceedings of workshop number one and noted that the board uh, was keenly interested not just in science, but in actionable science. That is scientific information, which helps inform how we could be managing the Delta better. In my brief time, I'd like to emphasize two interrelated points of actionable science from the panel's submitted materials. First, related to section 1.4 of our submittal, there has been a tendency to conflate the influence of river inflows with the influence of South Delta exports. Examples include flow metrics such as the I to E ratio and OMR. While these metrics are perhaps superficially appealing and even, even sensible in some instances, the use of these ratios implies that exports and inflows have equivalent effects. That is, that a unit, of, a unit decrease in exports is equivalent to an, a unit increase in inflows. For some species, this may be true, 
but for juvenile salmonids, at least, it appears not to be. While river inflows can yield benefits to juvenile salmonids, well into the tributaries where the waters originate, exports only influence the tidal portion of the delta. Generally speaking, the, the influence of exports on juvenile salmonids in the delta is an issue that is deserving of greater scrutiny. Given the large volumes of water pumped and the many thousands of fish salvaged annually, scientists have very reasonably hypothesized that these exports would be an important driver of juvenile salmonid success in the delta. Related studies of this effect began in the late 1970s and continue to this day. In fact, I was up to almost midnight last night working on a report from the 2012 uh, studies on this topic. The export hypothesis has been the subject of intensive study and experimentation beyond any other topic in the delta uh, for which I'm aware. It's important to note that these were not correlative analyses, as is often the case for other, uh, particularly for the pelagic fish species, but rather these were carefully planned experiments involving millions of tagged juvenile salmon. One example of such a study comes from the Vernalis Adaptive Management Program, which began, or which between 1985 and 2006, conducted 35 paired releases of juvenile Chinook salmon, including more than 6 million tagged fish. A detailed statistical analysis indicated that San Joaquin River inflows tended to be positively associated with improved survival, but found no evidence for the expected adverse effect of exports. And if you're looking at this slide here, the figure on the left shows the uh, different flow levels, kind of from high to low, top to bottom. And on the right shows the, the graph on the right shows the range of exports that were evaluated as part of these studies. Uh, perhaps more importantly, though, than the, the lack of evidence for a, an export effect um, is the fact that the study revealed a steep decrease in survival over the last 10 years. And that's indicated here by these red dotted lines. Uh, this isn't my figure. This comes from an independent science panel review of the VAMP report uh, from 2010. So th these survival declines for San Joaquin Basin emigrants have occurred um, despite exports being held at very low levels. Of course, there are other studies of export effects on juvenile salmonids in the Delta. Some have shown a negative association with exports. However, no study, and I again emphasize these are marker capture experiments, not correlative analyses. No study has yielded data supporting the original hypothesis that exports are an important driver of juvenile salmon and success in the Delta. Observing the poor fit between hypothesis and evidence, the high level of noise, and the apparently weak signal of exports, scientists should, I think, be wondering what the data is telling us. Why is the export signal weak? Is the system really that noisy? Or is the noise telling us that maybe we are not asking the right questions? Surely all these ambiguous results from export salmon survival studies mean something. I think they do. At a minimum, they strongly suggest a need to consider alternative hypotheses for what factors are driving juvenile salmon and survival in the delta. One such hypothesis relates to delta hydrodynamics. And this is related to section 3.4 of our panel's uh, submitted materials to the board. I'm really hoping somebody's going to jump in with a question to free me from Kenny's. Oh, no, you're good. You're good. All right, all right. But seriously, jump in. <laughs> so here in this slide, uh, we're looking at nine channels of the Central Delta. This is a, a key migration corridor for both San Joaquin and Sacramento Basin juvenile salmonids. And it's a, it's a segment of the delta that has been thought to be a primary area where exports would exert the, the adverse effects on juvenile salmonids. So what we're going to do is look at the flow conditions in these nine channels uh, with constant river inflows, which I indicated there on the graph, holding those constant, but looking at three different export levels. This is the calculated average daily flow for each of these channels with three different export levels. So the numbers within each uh, panel there are arrayed top to bottom from low, medium, and high exports. So what you see here is that we have uh, the red numbers are negative. So the, this is the reverse flow um, that we often, often hear about and are concerned about. Um, and these are large numbers. 
and they're disturbing. And in fact, these numbers, or these kinds of numbers, uh, were the foundation for the original hypothesis that exports would have an important adverse effect on juvenile salmonids. Now, with the exact same conditions, rather than looking at net flows, we are looking at flows every 15 minutes over a 24-hour period. Though a net negative flow can certainly be calculated, particularly with the higher levels of exports, in the context of real-world tidal flux, and that's really what we're seeing here with this variation, in the context of that tidal variation, we see very little difference between hydrodynamic conditions fish experience with exports. In light of this information, and knowing characteristics of juvenile salmonid migration and rearing behavior, I believe scientists, it would be prudent for scientists to consider alternative explanations for ambiguous export survival studies to date. Namely, we should consider that net negative flows in a tidal environment may be a poor indicator of potential adverse effects to juvenile salmonids. And then lastly, tying again back into the relationship between exports and inflows, this is a figure uh, that illustrates the transition, the point of transition on both the Sacramento and the San Joaquin, where we go from a river, riverine-driven system, where you have unidirectional flows, and a tidal system. And so what you can see here, looking at the Sacramento Basin first, at flows of, of 10,600 CFS, that red arrow indicates the point where it really becomes, uh, becomes a tidal delta. So the flows are going back and forth, about half and half throughout the day. Upstream of that point, it's a, it's a more of a riverine signal. The flows are mostly going in one direction. You push flows up to 32,000 CFS, and that point gets pushed further downstream to where the second arrow is. And the same thing can be seen on the San Joaquin River. So what, what this is telling us, that at points downstream of the red arrows, this is a tidal system. And our ability to influence that tidal system with inflows, uh, in terms of hydrodynamics at least, is pretty limited. And I would also add that the, the location of these arrows is very insensitive to export levels as well. That's all I have. Thank you. I, I do have a question. Uh, are you are you saying that exports are um, are not the the, the primary? If, if in in your opinion, it's it, the hypothesis that they're the primary um, factor in uh, in survival of salmonids. But what about other factors that have been raised, like regime change, which was mentioned earlier? A lot of um, a lot of changes in the delta. It, has someone looked at uh, exports in terms of contribu their contribution to this reg regime change? Not that I'm aware of, and, and I think that's sort of the point, is, is not to say that exports aren't important and we should ignore them, but rather that we've given them a tremendous amount of attention with regard to research and management actions and that we haven't done enough to explore other factors. And I guess if there's one takeaway message, it would be that. Oh. Yeah, to follow up on that, um, I guess, and you don't have to have the answer for this question, but I think I, I, as, as a board member, I have a question. If there are suggested metrics, things we can measure uh, for export-related impacts to salmonids, you know, so if it's not the old, river, old the net flow from Old Middle River or E to I ratio, you know, as we proceed in this workshop, I'm interested in alternative metrics because it's obviously of concern and well studied. Do, does anything come to mind? Well, I think, I think the ideal alternative metric is to be looking at survival through the delta um, and growth of fish, things that relate to the, to the uh, success of the populations at large. Um, those are things that can be measured with some difficulty. Um, So I'm going to uh, talk a bit about one of the uh, one of the issues we briefly touched about, which was uh, how the objectives affect one another. And uh, the example we gave was management of X2, how it affects the cold water pool, um, and how that indirectly or directly affects uh, temperature management for downstream salmonids. And uh, this is going to sound a bit uh, blatantly self-promotional, but we've developed a. Uh, a, uh, a tool for, for forecasting river temperatures on the Sacramento uh, River below Shasta Dam. Um, and it's a one-dimensional heat budget model, and it takes the discharge temperature and flow from Shasta, 
and, and then applies the uh, high resolution meteorological conditions that affect that water as it's traveling downstream uh, for, from hours to days and gives the eventual temperature and flow at a very high resolution uh, hourly for every kilometer of river uh, over the course of the whole, uh, say, we're currently at about 100 kilometers of river down to about um, Red Bluff, but we're very close to, to completing the model all the way down to uh, the city of Sacramento. And the idea here is, is it, was, um, it was developed for, for water management, for mostly for winter run Chinook in, in the, uh, on the Sacramento River. But this, this is a horrible graph, I apologize. This is the entire, uh, the entire season of temperature for every kilometer of river at, at a 15 minute interval. The color bar should give you temperature. What you can focus on here is this little cross section here, which is a Balls Ferry, a compliance point. And then this, this blow up graph shows uh, the model results. And the point here is that the model is very precise, very accurate um, at, at, at determining the temperature. And the point I want to make today is that um, it has the capacity to, to look at different discharge flows and temperatures. So if, if the interest is in, in management of, say, X2 or the amount of water that's, that's, that's entering the delta while simultaneously managing for the cold water pool, this is one way of, of potentially getting at that. And we're not, we're not exactly there yet. I don't want to jump the gun and say that, that we, we have the models complete. But if it was coupled with a, a reservoir model that would allow you to, to estimate the cold water pool versus the total volume of water in the reservoir, it would give you a very precise and accurate tool for determining how much water to release and at what temperature to meet those flow objectives downstream. And this is, this is a, a snapshot from the website that I just grabbed on Friday that shows how you can change these various uh, uh, scenarios for the, the discharge temperature and the flow. The green one would be what was currently being used at that time. This is the 56 degree compliant point, compliance point. And then these little X's show the, the, the 24 hour mean for each one of these scenarios. So it, it allows you to look at these different scenarios and see how those will uh, meet the temperature objectives. But it also, somewhere down the line, again, I I'm, I'm, don't want to sound like I'm getting ahead of myself, could also be used for meeting both the requirements for, or at least as a tool for helping to determine both the requirements for meeting X2 and for temperature management for, um, for salmon. Eric, on those studies, has there been any effort to incorporate degrees of turbidity along with it to see if there's any efficacy that goes along with higher turbidity coming from upstream? Or no, no, not at, not at this point. Would that be potentially of use? Well, um, I don't, I couldn't say. Um, that's not something that I have any, uh, any expertise on. Perhaps one of the other uh, panel members might. Have some input. You guys are good at that. Yeah, good as survivors. Um, and then, um, very briefly, uh, to regards to your uh, question, uh, Chairman Hoppin, uh, you mentioned something about the wanting to know, be able to model when the fish, the adult fish, were returning um, from the ocean. And we are uh, working on a couple different life cycle models now. One of them is taking a dynamic energy budget approach, which looks at the entire life cycle from egg to adult uh, for individual fish and how they allocate resources towards reproduction and growth. And that will provide an estimate as to when they mature and would return to the uh, river. But that, again, this is a couple years down the line. Yeah. Well, I'd, <coughs> I'd like to just, I don't have any slides. Um, I'd like to take a chance to uh, emphasize and amplify probably three points that hopefully are coming through already. Um, and uh, the first is the need to quantify ocean force, forcing, in inverted commas, how, to what extent the ocean drives the estuary, and, uh, and specifically how, how the variability in the ocean comes through into the upper estuary, in other words, the low salinity zone. There are some aspects of the ocean that undeniably, if the, if the sea level rises, by a foot during a windstorm, <coughs> it rises in the delta by a foot. If it rises, um, you know, a foot through climate change, it rises in the delta through a foot. Th those are obvious and, and, and easy, but um, not sure that we really always recognize those. Um, the salinity 
um, the, the, when you see 11 parts per thousand salinity, that's one-third seawater, two-thirds fresh water. The ocean undoubtedly is still important at that zone, but that water might be really old and all the sort of good stuff, all the nutrients and plankton might be gone or not. And we don't really know that. Um, there was a, a paper that Kim et al. did in 2012 where they did see marine uh, plankton right up into the Sassoon Bay area during high flow, which is sort of counterintuitive. But like I was saying earlier, it's almost like a spring. Uh, as you push the seawater back, you start the so-called estuarine circulation. You push it back, but it's getting turned around fast. It's getting sucked in from the ocean fast at the same time. So I think we really need to understand those. I think we can quantify them. We have started some work along those lines, but it's a pretty big task, really, compared to how much we know from the other side. Um, <coughs> secondly, um, the, the, uh, to identify an unequivocal links between factors. There are a number of links which are sort of obvious, but I'm not sure that we've really documented or put them down. So for example, um, maybe the best one is with nutrients now and ammonia is that uh, there are two controls on the concentration. The one is how much you put into the water, and the other is how much water you put in with the ammonia. And so the flow controls concentration as much as, as, as loading does. But there are, and that's sort of a, an obvious, uh, almost deterministic problem. <coughs> and there are lots of other more subtle aspects to that. But I think we need to uh, have some of these um, uh, sort of identified and, 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 and clearly understood by all the parties involved, no matter whether it's the water board or other agencies. And then uh, the, the third one really uh, connects back again to not only to our report, but to some other comments here that the uh, fish as individuals experience a small scale environment. And when we have indices, we really need to recognize the mechanism through which fish are experiencing this environment. So w to manage a system, you have to have aggregate indicators. You have to have sort of simple indicators, but they have to be true to mechanism at the same time. Otherwise, they're based on past history and sooner or later, they're gonna fail. Whereas if there's a mechanism underneath it, and I think this is a key part of what I take from Brad's comments, is we have, have to understand why the flow affects fish. And even though things may or may not have worked in the past, the more we can uh, get a mechanism in there, then the more value, the more reliability, and the more long-term uh, value that'll have. So some of these um, um, multi multiple influences um, will break down the more we manage the system. Some multiple influences co-vary because nature has made them co-vary. When it rains, the wind blows on the ocean, the wind on the ocean raises the sea level, the rain comes out of the watershed. That's it. But we're breaking apart some of those co-variability the more we manage the system. But other things will continue to co-vary. The more water we put in, the lower will be the nutrient concentrations because no matter how you do it, that's a really basic relationship. So those are the three things I wanted uh, to uh, To that point, I mean, if you, with sea level rise, we may get to a point where we don't have the luxury of putting enough water to keep it at, at bay at the areas that we have been attempting to. Um, but getting back to the comment about the adaptability of, of pelagic fish, and somebody else can answer this, I mean, is it possible that with the increase or the intrusion of salinity, if you will, because of climate change, that the pelagics will simply, simply adapt their more saline habitat to an up area. You know, you, you, you talked, I believe, Randy, about them leaving Liberty Island and the Deepwater Channel and spending a goodly portion of their time in the more saline stretches further down. If we have the intrusion of salt water as a result of climate change, is that necessarily a negative to these pelagic organisms, or will they just simply adapt, as we're saying, to a comparable saline environment that's in a different part of the system? Um, I think that there's probably some uh, range for adaptability, but I think our main concern, and in, in currently it's maybe somewhat hypothetical, is that in the interim, as the climate change is occurring and salinity is intruding farther upstream, you've got, you know, kind of two ha types of habitats that are butting into one another. And uh, within the delta, with uh, a number of the shoreline predators and such, you know, there's, there's concern that before they get pushed back, that, that there'll be more interaction 
you know, that's one of the issues, and I don't know whether you want to speak well, to Well, certainly is not, let more. me clarify, this is not my intent to say we just forsake those efforts because it's going to change anyhow, but potentially at some point we could find ourselves in a situation where we don't have the luxury of this hydraulic hammer, if yeah, you will. Yeah, I, I can certainly understand that. Um, we're, as part of the um, fall low salinity habitat studies, we're going to try and investigate those types of issues. And one of the responses that um, we hope to measure is what the fish do in years like this, where the low salinity habitat may not be out in Sassoon Bay in the fall. Um, the fall period tends to be very, late summer fall tends to be very challenging in terms of finding enough food to withstand the higher temperatures and somewhat higher salinities for delta smelt. And as they're moved into the western delta and into some of the deeper channels, we've got some concerns about how well they're active actually going to be able to um, survive those conditions and we hope to be looking at that in enough depth to maybe speculate on what might happen as as it proceeds further upstream. I appreciate that answer very much. Thank you. Um, could I um, ask Professor Larger, or I appreciated your comments and I think I'd like just a little more clar uh, clarification on the state of knowledge about biological responses to the ocean uh, effects during high flow events and did you have the opportunity uh, in the 2011 flash studies to uh, test any hypotheses of biological response or nutrient dynamic response because um, maybe to others it, it is kind of counterintuitive intuitive because the ocean is far from the delta, right? But to someone like me who's studied estuarine hydrodynamics a in college, uh, it's not counterintuitive. And I think it's one of those, as we've talked, as you've discussed today, there is a, um, something that goes with flow in the San Joaquin River, for instance, you know, the productivity. That's an example of flow being with another function. In this case, I find it compelling to look at gravitational circulation effects uh, just to understand that's you know the effects uh, in productivity further downstream you've heard me as a board member talk about my interest in further downstream issues with the bay um, so getting back to my question the bio uh, you, you 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 brought this up under the uncertainty discussion right. so um, what certainties have you discovered uh, about this important physical and biological interaction Right. So, as an individual, I didn't. I didn't put him up there. Okay. Because <laughs> I was looking. Yeah. As, as an individual, I've, I was not involved in that study, or or actually in in direct studies in the low low salinity zone. Um, from having looked at the study, I don't. Uh, I don't believe that was that was evaluated much. But I might look left and right at my colleagues here, Ted. So. Um, it wasn't something that we really focused on, but I could mention a couple of things. First, um, we did look at the diet of species like delta smelt, and it was more unusual in 2011 than we expected. Perhaps there was a marine uh, effect there. But regarding nutrients and transport of marine phytoplankton that Dr. Kimmerer has described, um, we did not see evidence of that. We did see a phytoplankton bloom that occurred in fall, but occurred all the way upstream at Ria Vista, far away from any likely oceanic influence. Okay. All right, well, I'll um, go ahead and wrap things up for the, the panel. Like John, I don't have any uh, pretty slides to go with my, my brief spiel. But I want to try and uh, emphasize that several of the things that the panel has uh, talked about actually tie together pretty nicely. Um, specifically, regime shifts, uh, the lack of rearing habitat, or for Kenny's uh, benefit, I'll say shallow water area, uh, the need for habitat diversity, and the need to anticipate um, some future changes. So we talked a little bit about uh, regime shift, and it's a huge deal for pelagic fishes in the estuary. But I think there's an equal argument that there's perhaps been a similar longer-term regime shift for salmon migrating downstream through the system. 
Um, I'm going to be blunt. I think one of the things we've essentially done over decades and decades is turn the Sacramento River into more of a drainage canal um, than, than a real river. It historically had broad riparian areas, uh, floodplain, tidal wetlands. What we have now is something that's deep, it's fast, it's steep, and over the past uh, couple decades we've converted the banks into armored riprap. Um, as a person that lives in the historical floodplain, I'm thrilled about this to protect my home from, from going underwater. It works really well for flood control. Um, it also works well to wash out the historical accumulated um, hydraulic mining debris from, from the gold rush. A lot of the geometry we see now is because of, of the concerns about mining sediments. It also works pretty well to flush out um, treated wastewater and contaminants. But the new regime is a complete disaster for salmon migrating downstream. Um, we've been studying salmon rearing and survival along the corridor from Sacramento to around Ria Vista for about 15 years now. And we've, we've learned a fair bit about what happens to fish as they go along. And one of the, the key things as we see as they go down the Sacramento corridor, down that heavily modified regime, is that first there's no food for the fish. The water's moving too fast to generate plankton for, for young salmon to eat. And secondly, there's no vegetation to create um, insects that will drop into the water for them. The other part of the story that we talked a little bit about is there's also nowhere to hide for the fish. The banks are so steep, there's no shallow water area for the young fish to, to, to rest or, or hide. Um, so they're really sitting ducks for the, the predators as, th as they're making their way down. Um, and unlike natural rivers, um, flow doesn't make a huge difference in the availability of that shallow water area or food. The whole thing behaves more like a bathtub than a river. It's got steep-sided banks and the river gets higher and higher and you don't get any more shallow area until the thing ultimately spills over like a bathtub. In this case, our bathtub or bathroom floor is, is Yolo Bypass. I don't want to say, though, that flow has absolutely no effect on, on the salmon as they move through the system. I think you'll be hearing uh, from some of the other speakers today that there is a positive benefit of flow on salmon survival as they migrate through the system. Um, but one of the things to keep in mind is that this may simply be because higher flow creates an express bus that rushes fish um, through the delta as fast as possible. Obviously, that helps get them through the bad habitat. Um, but th the dark side of this is that we have also a lot of evidence that life history diversity um, is one of the key metrics we have to pay attention to for salmon population health. And, and what that means is that simply rushing fish as fast as possible through the delta um, may improve survival, but may ultimately undermine uh, the population by just homogenize everything. There's only one bus that goes down through this route, and if you're a salmon, if you don't get on that bus, I I it's all over. So what we're missing here we is- We're talking about narrowing natural selection here, Ted. Yes, yes. Yeah, it, well, it's, it's, it's fairly selective. We're doing the, the selection by creating this habitat, by creating Maybe this I should have said unnatural selection. Unnatural selection, yeah. indeed. But I, I guess my key point is what we're, we're missing here, and, and we talked about this again in the presentation, is enough habitat or shallow area for fish to exercise other life history strategies, staying in the delta longer, coming into the delta at a small size and not getting eaten right away. Um, so again, this kind of ties together a few of the things we talked about, and I want to talk just briefly about what that may mean for you um, in your decision making. First, I want to emphasize that targets that focus just on fish survival are only going to be part of the story. Survival is just one part of many things that salmon need um, to be healthy. Um, the second point is we do need some variability in our flow regimes. Flatlining the river is not obviously the answer. But we also need some rearing habitat here. Um, otherwise, we're going to continue to see an erosion of, of the health of the salmon um, in the valley. So in that context, one of the things that uh, in my individual comments I'm asking you to do is to try and anticipate um, some of the future projects that may um, benefit for young salmon. And this is, um, this is 
probably going to be something that will be echoed in some of the other speakers' comments, but Yolo Bypass um, is probably the best opportunity to provide rearing habitat for salmon. It's poor connectivity with the Sacramento River. There are going to be some water rights issues with connecting the Sacramento River in a better way. I'm hoping the board can do something to try and anticipate that and grease the skids to, to make changes like that um, happen faster. So that's it. Ted, to your comments, uh, I mean, one of the glaring successes that we've had with salmon in California and, and naturally spawned fish to boot has been in Butte Creek. And Butte Creek, to me, typifies your comments about a drain ditch because the rearing habitat for smolts in Butte Creek is truly a drain ditch. And, but that is contrary to what we hear a lot about with flows because it's almost a stagnant drain ditch at times, but yet because of turbidity and, and the refugia that you're talking about and the habitat, there's success that in many respects is unequaled in Northern California, certainly. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that, unless I'm missing something, I see Randy nodding in the affirmative instead of giving me a devil eye here. But, uh, uh, you know, I, I assume that t typifies what you're talking about. That's right. It, it, there has been more progress in providing habitat further upstream, better gravel, um, some small floodplain projects, but the delta still represents this long biological desert, if you will, that, that fish have to traverse in order to survive. Randy, would you like to follow up on that? I just, I just wanted to, to chime in because I have some experience in the Sutter Bypass, which is the end of Butte Creek. And, and similar to the Yolo, um, there are areas where the fish can get out of the main channel and spread out into lower velocity areas with some vegetation and such. And I think that that has a lot to do with uh, the success in, in that area. And you know, echoing what Ted said, if we can link some of the Sacramento system more closely to uh, the Yolo Bypass, I think that would seem similar benefits. Would the high turbidity be a factor there as well in the Sutter? Say would the high turbidity in the Sutter be a factor? The high turbidity in the Sutter system, I mean, obviously, uh, it's not very clear. Yeah, well, I think, I think that's a, a definite benefit. I mean, you know, it's one of the situations where the stream can get out of the flood or out onto the floodplain, so it, it picks up materials. We, we've studied the, the fish and what they do in Yolo Bypass for quite a while now. They seem to be fine at the higher turbidities as long as there's somewhere to hide, get out of the current, and as long as the food comes to them, it doesn't seem to be a huge issue. Thank you both. So we're at the conclusion here. Um, and uh, I'm just going to take a minute or two to get my individual comments in. Um, <laughs> uh, Ted was very excited. so, um, uh, And we don't need the, the slides. It's OK. I just wanted to make uh, three brief comments on my reading of the flow criteria report, the August 2010 document that I, from somewhat of an outsider may, may help in, in clarity. Uh, one was um, uh, uh, I followed the logic very well, and, uh, and then, it, then I hit a spot and everything sped up very quickly in the report, and it kind of became a little bit of a gray box. So, so it started with single species. It went to what others suggested. It went to what the board staff thought was good. And then there was some logit stuff, and then it went to percent unimpaired flows. And what I would have liked to have seen, I think what might strengthen that analysis would be to then close the loop and go back and, and compare, if you did, the percent unimpaired flows by water year, how does it compare to the actual outflows that were recommended by the various groups, you know, the closing that loop. And it, for someone more experienced in the system, you can probably read it off those exceedance graphs. But I, 